Hello everyone, I'm Annie Gibbons and you're listening to Memoirs of Successful Women, the podcast where you get to hear candid conversations with fascinating women from around the globe who share aspects of their business and life journey, how they measure their success and what they have learned along the way. Well, hello and welcome to Memoirs of Successful Women. Today, I'm introducing you to Dr. Ruby Bakshi Kurdi, who is an award-winning international motivational public speaker, global goodwill ambassador for Switzerland, chairperson for All Ladies League. She's a charismatic educationalist, a social entrepreneur, a leadership and cultural trainer. Uh, This woman is certainly amazing. I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. So join me in welcoming Dr. Ruby. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. It's really a pleasure to be on your show and be talking to you live. I'm I'm really happy having this conversation. Thank you. (laughs) It is such a pleasure. And I know we've been lining it up for a while. It's just, you know, it's amazing when people just are so busy doing what they're passionate about. You've just kind of got to wait till those times align. And it's always just so worth the wait because um, I just get constantly dazzled by what people are doing around the world and particularly inspiring women. And, and I was just saying before we before we went um, on to the show, you know, that you still look so incredibly beautiful, young and, and energetic for a woman who's just achieved so much. So well done you for really pushing the boundaries on what is truly possible. I think it's so inspirational when you just see, you know, um, when someone is led by their heart and their passion, you know, what they can achieve in life. So uh, I'm looking forward to you sharing your journey with us. How about you give the listeners a, a little glimpse into, you know, what are you doing at the moment? What does your life look like? And then we'll unpack how you actually got to where you are today. Um, I'm an educationist, uh, settled in Switzerland for last almost 20 years now. So this is home. Um, and I have been, as you said, I'm really, really passionate about certain things like where people need to connect and evolve as people. Because everyone is doing their bits. You know, we are all working, we are all taking care of your careers. But when we get connected with people who are not just thinking or working for themselves, but for the people, it becomes beautiful. And I think my this beautiful journey started in terms of, uh, you know, evolving myself in a foreign country. Because when I came here, I felt a bit lonely. Switzerland is beautiful. It's amazing. Yeah. But I missed connections. I missed the warmth that I had in India. Because when you come from your culture, you know, you are a one person. But when you go to another culture, you are expecting those things there as well. And when you don't find them, you are kind of, okay, what do I do? And how do I do? Yeah. So that's how this amazing journey of uh, creating women network started, um, creating social network started, social cultural network started. It was nothing planned, but something that just led to another, like a domino effect. You know, one thing led to another. Yeah. And it's beautiful. Um, I'm having my beautiful networks where we are helping each other evolve, where we are helping each other connect and celebrate as well because, uh, I mean, having a good integration in the Swiss culture as well as in the Indian culture. So whenever some things are happening in India, we make it sure that we make it happen here in Switzerland as well and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And teaching it to our children as well, you know, with other moms. Uh, We always make it a point that when there are certain festivals, we celebrate together and share the stories because India is a big country, you know, from yes. up north to down south, you will have so many different cultures and so many different stories happening. So we make it a point that we share it with our children so that they know and they share it further. <laughs> I mean, it's so important, so important. And it's just a huge contrast to go from India to Switzerland. If I can imagine two diff- just polar opposite countries, it's just amazing that, you know, coming from a place where you just feel, you know, is, is your home, is just, you know, everything that you live and breathe. It's where your support systems are and then to find yourself in Switzerland. And as you said mm. before, suddenly suddenly feeling really lonely. And I know a lot of people listening in will have had those experiences. Sometimes it's just moving a couple of towns. You know, you suddenly move or a different job. You, you suddenly find yourself in a different context. And it's, it's amazing how quickly, you know, it, it pulls, the, pulls the rug out from underneath you, right? It suddenly surfaces all of those sort of, you know, what grounds you. And so for Mm -hmm. you to find yourself in in Switzerland and now, how long have you been in Switzerland for? 20 years. 
20 years. So now you are truly, truly Swiss. <laughs> <laughs> truly Swiss, but at heart, I'm always an Indian. I'm always yeah. connecting, always sharing that warmth everywhere. So here everyone really, I mean, now I'm like a part of the community. You know, we, we have we have families, we have uh, home away from home families and beautiful networks. So it's it's nice now. It's nice now. And it's uh, completely different to what it was those years when I started here. Yeah, because you've made it your own and that's what it is. It requires effort. It requires initiative. It requires you either choosing to sort of settle and feel, you know, it, it, sometimes it can take people a very long time to get connected and other True. people such as yourself go and says, okay, this feels really uncomfortable actually. It feels really lonely, mm -hmm. but what am I going to do that? And I suppose you were therefore a pioneering educationalist because yes. you know, back in the day going online, you know, many many years ago before it became the vogue now uh, it yeah. allowed you just to tap into that global view uh, tell us a little bit about that journey you know of being an educationalist in a new country and then sort of seeing that the world is actually your oyster <laughs> <laughs> very true I mean uh, when I came here I was very young and uh, kind of settling in not sure how it's gonna be how long and I'm gonna be in this country because before I was just here for a short period of time um, but I think because I was so cautious and also very much sure that I want to do something in education because my background is master's in business administration. So I wanted to continue that. Uh, back home in India, I was a young principal. I became a principal of a college at a very young age. Uh, so that was God's grace that blessed me. And when I came here, it helped me to become or start in a very prestigious all-girls education institution in Switzerland. So I started here as a lecturer in uh, business administration. I was teaching the bachelor's in business administration students. Uh, and it was a very prestigious school. But when I was there, I felt, wow, this is a developed country and we're still using blackboard. We are still using chalk. Yeah. And back home in India, we had some modern ways of doing. We were using PowerPoint slides, we were using slides, we had projector. So it was different. So I thought, why not introduce those things here as well? So when I started discussing that with our director at that point of time, he was a Swiss German guy and he said, oh, no, 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 it's too much. Jean Timo, slowly, slowly, uh, we are not in a race. We will do, but gradually. So I said, yeah, yeah, we'll do gradually. But if we have to be competitive, if we yeah. have to be innovative and beyond other, other people in this industry, we have to make an effort. We can't be doing things which are 50 years old. <laughs> Back then it worked, but now it's not going to work. Exactly. So I think somehow he liked the idea, though he did not like it in the beginning because it was an investment. Yeah. But then somehow he liked an idea and he gave me the green signal. Okay, go ahead. I give you this period of time and this is your budget. And if this fits well and we have it running, we have more people coming and joining, then it's a green from me and then you are on. But if this in this period of time it doesn't work and we feel it's not happening, our teachers are not happy or others are not happy adapting, then we'll go back to the old system. Yeah. And I took it as a challenge. I took it as a challenge. I worked very hard for first six months to make it happen, to involve everyone. Um, I was one of the first persons to get a beamer here in the school. Uh, you know, it was not easy, but because he made an investment and I said every teacher should use computers. You know, we should have gamification in the classroom because when yeah. you are teaching a language, especially because some of the language teachers said, oh, it's not good. How are we going to do with the computer? You know, I have all my notes. I have all my exercises. I have great books. I don't want to switch. Yes. And then I said, I'm not telling anyone to switch. I'm just making life easy for you. Mm -hmm. Every time you have to start from scratch. But on this, you have your folders, you have your modules. Everything is set and done. All you need to do is click and update. That's it. So I think that caught their attention and the director was very happy. And within, I would say, six months from a lecturer, I became the academic dean of the school, which I had joined. And I was the youngest teacher. I was the youngest teacher. But from youngest teacher, I became the youngest head of the institution. Yes. <laughs> so that was quite a journey. And I felt immediately connected to this country because I felt they welcomed me. Yeah, This was a start of a career. This was a start of an era where they believed in my passion. They believed in my madness at that point of time. 
and uh, you know the director was very helpful he was uh, god bless him kind man that he had that trust in me and gradually the other teachers also trusted and we became as a team we started working as a team so that was i would say good 2002 and now we are in 2021 and now in this span of time i have worked in three different universities um, i have been consistent i don't change i work together yeah at that time i was a dean so when i was a dean i was just focusing on that school but later thereafter i worked in other schools as well where i became a part and everywhere i wanted to have innovative methods of learning and gamification in the learning system yeah. because when we do things in this way i think students love it you know they are engaged they are participating and they look forward to the lesson they don't feel it's a punishment to go to the classroom they feel it's fun to go to the classroom so this is how i want to teach and this is how i want others to teach as well oh, i absolutely love that and i actually yeah, relate on on in some ways i've got a masters of education as well and i used to be a head teacher of a nursing school and that same sort of journey when you're younger uh-huh. and other people have been there you know for a longer period of time and they can feel a little bit put out by the fact that you know how are you in this senior role and that that point where you know they they feel that they have spent many years and so many hours preparing that content whether it was on mm-hmm. powerpoint or you know um their notes for class and this this feeling of but i've invested so much i don't want to change it you know it's kind of like now i should be ready for the easier time because i'm confident in the way i teach and i totally love your approach and and i um I remember going through that myself of going, well, how about, you know, that's right, you don't want to teach, you know, death by PowerPoint. You just want to mix it up, have opportunities, learning engagement, or even as learners have changed. You know, now that's right. They actually do Mm -hmm. want to um, add those gamification aspects and make it fun and enjoyable. You don't want your students all sort of sleepy at the back of the room. You want them to be enjoying. Because when we enjoy learning, we actually process it. We, we, We imagine ourselves doing and that's that fine line of just hearing content and then applying it to our context. Uh, I True. love it. One of my daughters is a re- is learning Korean at the moment, which is is fabulous. And she's um she I'm, I'm watching the aspects of the gamification, you know, daily. She's she's as she learns it, she's wanting to make sure that she gets new badges and she she goes up the up the tree of you know all this sort of thing. It's so exciting. She's more excited about I got to the castle rather than you know, <laughs> how many words you've learned. But you know it does make a difference because it's kind of like what entices you to come back and and keep broadening uh, your skills and then all. Also, in a, a global perspective, you know, you can be competing then against other people. You can be learning with those people. And it's, that is super exciting as well. Very true. Very true. <laughs> so you've got, I'm imagining you've got students from all around the world now. Yes, yes. Uh, we have students from all over the world. And apart from teaching in the university, um, I would really like to share on your platform that I started an e-learning platform of my own which is very new. I would say it's just 45 days old. Um, And I think it was a learning experience during COVID um, when we were all struggling. We were all not knowing how to do and what to do, um, how to make learning fun, how to engage the audience on Zoom or Teams or different online platforms. Yeah. So then I thought, why not do something which is constructive and long running, you know, long term. Mm. So I wrote a book. My book was published this year which was on the experiments which I had been doing. You know, it's an amazing, uh, it's like a handbook now, you know, and and this is really helping educators as well as trainers. It's not just for the teachers, but anyone who's using online platform, how to rock your virtual (laughs) classrooms, basically. I love that. (laughs) So the name of the book is How to Engage Learners in Virtual Learning Environment. And it's available on Amazon, on Book Depository, on all various uh, platforms. But the motive I wrote the book was how we can help each other. Maybe mm. something is working for Annie, something is working for me. So I share your things and pen it down. I shared my other fellow collaborators' things and pen it down. And together, that book came up. But then the I thought like not many people read book. Though the book is doing well, it is reaching the audiences, it's going where it has to go. People are taking it as a handbook. E-learning platform was something which I thought it is consistent because now more and more people are moving towards e-learning. Yes. 
so i thought skill development is necessary doesn't matter what age what color what place you come from what country you come from so i started this e learning where i launched the very first program masterclass on virtual learning environment where anyone can take it at any time it's like a crisp course 60 minutes crisp course uh, so there is a free masterclass where again you have quizzes so for starters like if you are really struggling you can immediately dive in but for the people who are thinking long term like you know educators as well as trainers there's a certificate program as well so which is available at any time maybe 10 minutes today 10 minutes tomorrow in total it's just 60 minutes yes. so i just launched this program uh, which has really helped a lot of teachers already a lot of teachers have enrolled and they're doing it and they're sending me now beautiful testimonials and it's it's really rewarding when you see that and the second program which i launched it is emotional intelligence mm. it's during this time i felt we need to practice empathy bit more though i had been doing i come from a school of thought where teacher is not just a teacher but she or he is a facilitator yes of knowledge yes we are facilitators we are giving something to the students who can become or who can evolve with that information mm -hmm. but during this period i felt empathy was is something that should be in the curriculum not just felt when we are in crisis mode <laughs> or not just be practice when something is not happening in a good manner yeah so this is the second master class that i have launched uh, it's a one week old only and again the motive is to help the people so that they become emotionally intelligent mm. whether you are in successful careers very stressful careers politicians or people in any any job which is very stressful and we are all the time like this yeah. stay away i have to do stay away i have this you know so that's a course to help those people uh, so these two courses i have just launched and i feel this is a requirement now the more we have something the more is the need to share it with the people and they can benefit doesn't matter which part of the world they are they can take the course and benefit from those things <laughs> i think, absolutely uh, i think it's an amazing concept to teach emotional intelligence you know that it, on the surface of that that's very challenging you know because mm -hmm. it's, it's so unique to all of us how we how we process the whole concept of emotional intelligence and how how um, that affects us so I think I'm going to have to definitely jump on that masterclass to see um, how you do that I think that's brilliant I love what um, you've said about e-learning e which is you know got skyrocketed definitely during uh, COVID and the challenges that we've had you know so whether you were on that bandwagon or not you, you certainly have to be now and, mm -hmm. and I love the concept that it brings there is which is bite-sized learning you know when you said you've got a 60 minute course and some per some person can just sit there for 60 minutes and other people go I've got five minutes or 10 minutes and I can drop in and I can do that I think more and more our consumers are wanting that you know because they've all got busy lives they've all got True. juggling many many things and and also some people learn differently you know they can't yeah. focus for a long period of time and so they they like the concept of um, breaking it down or also just going back and listening again you know that learning True. journey is different for all of us so mm -hmm. uh, fantastic it's amazing that you've chosen those two topics when you've got an MBA and the other things that you do you've chosen those two courses to be your your first ones that you've just launched uh, so it must be that you are totally in the moment. You're listening to what's actually happening uh, with consumers and thinking, mm -hmm. okay, well, this is what I have to provide for them. How did you become a global goodwill ambassador? What does that mean and what, what sort of role do you have there? Global goodwill ambassador happened a couple of years ago. I got a message on LinkedIn um, from Richard, who is the founder of Global Goodwill Ambassadors, and he i got when i got the message he said that we would like you to be a part of global goodwill ambassadors because you're doing something great something phenomenal and we want you to continue doing that so when you're getting a recognition i was like oh, wow that's amazing but what yeah. do i have to do yes. so he said just continue doing what you are doing so i was <laughs> like uh, did i understand it correctly like i don't have additional responsibilities he said once you start becoming a part of gga you will feel that there is a need there's always a need of improvement mm. so what i would say in the beginning to you is just continue doing what you are doing no additional responsibilities no additional work you are a humanitarian at heart which we can see and we want you to evolve with us 
Hmm. And that's how it started. And uh, today, I think I completed almost, I would say, four years that I've been with them. And the journey has been phenomenal because during that period of time, I, I launched two programs on YouTube on emotional intelligence and women empowerment. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's, it's again self-paced, uh, no free. It's completely free for anyone and everyone. It's again something that they watch the videos listen and understand, analyze those videos and answer a few questions which are there in the video. Mm -hmm. When I did that, it was Lisa, uh, who is the co-founder. She was the one, both of them, I would say, they kind of pushed me. You have the knowledge, you have the information and you have great content. When you speak, just record it. So like this, it is documented somewhere, you know, because you are doing so many talks everywhere, but you're not doing anything for yourself. So I think it's high time that you make a course, document it, make it available to the masses. And then that is something that you can call, it's like your legacy that you're leaving behind. Yeah. And at that time, I was like, can I do it? I don't think so. I don't have time. You know, I'm so busy. I have so many things happening. I have small children, my career, home. So they said, if you are passionate, you will take out time. We are not pushing you. But I think it's a good suggestion because you have the content you have the passion for it just do it and I'm so happy I listened to Richard and Lisa at that point of time and today those courses are running so well so many people have taken those courses and the type of messages and emails that I receive is like I want my daughter to be like you it helped me in my career you know I'm emotionally resilient now you know those kind of Uh messages I I feel so good and it gives me additional responsibility to give more yes (laughs) And I think that is GGA that pushes you in a very subtle way. You are doing a great job, but something more can be added. You know, something more can be done to make life meaningful. And that's how the journey started. And then I'm I'm writing blogs in the magazine. They have a GGA uh, ambassador magazine, the ambassador. So where we are trying to share the work of people all over the world, the humanitarians, what they are doing. Um, I'm highlighting. Right now I'm doing a section on... uh, on GGA Spotlight, where I'm choosing the people from our GGA ambassadors and sharing their work, why they are the ambassador for this particular month, um, which is I'm preparing the YouTube video and it's also documented in the ambassador magazine. So we have a link where people can hear the video as well. Um, and again, I started with virtual learning environment, how things can be done, because this was last year that I gave, I started a series every month, I was starting a special platform, go for this platform, this will make life better, go for that platform. So yeah. every month, I was introducing a specific platform. I think as an educationist, um, I always want to share certain expertise, which are working for us, how yeah. it can work for others in different parts of the world. So that's how my journey has been with them. Incredible journey. Incredible journey. And I love that that your instant thought when you get offered an opportunity is, okay, well, what do I need to do or what is expected of me, right? And that's the default yeah. because you're expecting of people to ask and it to be a big chore. But actually it's a total honour because if you encourage someone just to be more of their essence, more of who they are, then you will be rewarded pretty much tenfold anyway because, you know, it's almost permission to be you, Dr. Ruby, you know, to, to keep keep pioneering, keep sharing, keep um, offering opportunities for people. And it's amazing how much is actually um, yeah, free, free out there, free online that people can mm-hmm. follow. Uh, it is the biggest joy, absolutely, when people say that your your words, your input has, has changed their lives, really. You know, is it the power of the word and the power of support is never to be underestimated. And that, sure. that must just bring you so much joy. Yeah. Very true. Very true. (laughs) Just listening to them makes me feel that, yes, I'm doing something, you know, Uh, because whenever I do something, certain things are planned. Of course, I have a to do list. I need to do this. I need to do that. But certain things which just happened, like writing a book just happened. Having my e-learning platform just happened. I never thought I'm going to be an entrepreneur. Never. I never thought I will have a business where I'm trying to put my own thing, which I'm very passionate about into, you know, practice like this. But I guess God had chosen me for certain things. You know, it was all destined that I have to do these things. And it is just happening automatically. It's just happening. (laughs) Have you found that it is better to stay in the moment and just let it happen organically, if you like? Or do you 
future plan now and go, okay, well, what, what is likely that I'll do in two years, five years, 10 years? What works best for you? I think it's a mix of both. Certain things, yes, I plan in a way like, you know, let, let's say when I'm accepting my, um, I, because I do corporate training as well, I'm invited to different countries for webinars, seminars, and as, as a keynote speaker. So yeah. certain things I plan, like let's say I see my kids' calendars, like, you know, uh, when they are having their holidays so that I can club it with a family holiday. So I travel to different countries with my children. As a family, we travel. My husband also plans his holidays accordingly so that we are together as a family, living the moment I am doing my things, which I'm supposed to do, and thereafter spend quality time with the family. So yes, certain things I plan because uh, family has always been my number one priority. That's why I never worked full time. I've never worked 100%. Even mm -hmm. when I was the academic dean, of the institution, of that prestigious institution, I worked kind of 60%, you know, mm -hmm. because I feel as a mom, we have that responsibility as well to take care of the family and the children. Mm -hmm. So that's why certain things were planned. And at that point of time, I was working a little bit more, but handling it in a very delicate way. Mm -hmm. Now my children are a little older. So it's again a conscious decision to step down. Mm -hmm. I'm working as a lecturer in two different colleges here, as I said. Um, but I stepped down from the management position because I feel now my kids are priority again and I need to focus on them. Mm. And my other social projects, which I call my petty projects or my passionate projects, are something that keep on happening. You know, when they are traveling, I do this. Or when they are busy with their work, I accept a you know webinar and things like that. So those things I plan. Yes, where that's very normal that I plan that I don't overdo or underdo. But other things like um, like being on the advisory board or being on a women empowerment board, you know, those kind of things. I don't plan. I first understand why are they inviting me for that? What is in return? What is it going to be? You know, because it's good that these things are coming up, but you don't have to say yes to everything because you can't do everything. Yes. And you can't do justice to all the roles that you're playing. So that's why in some places I stay back. I restrict myself from doing too much so that there's no compromise on quality and uh, have the good balance, have a balance between your personal, professional, as well as family life. That's very important. Mm. <laughs> I think it is so important and I thank you for sharing it and I thank you for showing people, those listening in, that it is actually possible. You know, I have a lot of people saying, oh, well, I won't have the opportunities if I don't work, you know, full time or even more. If, you know, I'm feeling too uncomfortable if I ask, you know, a manager if I can do reduced hours or do, do it in a different, you know, across, across more flexibly across the week so that I can have that time with my kids. They feel that, you know, it stops them and they don't take those steps. But here you have shown, and it's not a guarantee for everybody, but that's right. If it is important to you, ask for those opportunities. Make, try and make them happen. And here you have shown that you've juggled it across very senior positions, uh, that you've sort of just come out front and said, yeah, I'm available for those. I want them to happen. But, you know, I also know what my balance is. And I think it's most important that we do spend time as mums, women, really searching, go, well, what is that balance for us? And it will be different for every person, right? I'm sure it's different. But the thing is that, you know, as a woman, especially, we have to ask, we have to explain why I'm saying so. Maybe I was lucky. I was blessed that I started at a higher level. You know, I started up there. I was already in the top management level. And having worked as a dean of a college for almost 10 years, it was not easy for me to step down. Of course, when you taste power, once you yeah. are in the decision making uh, position for so long, um, it's not easy to be a lecturer. But then, yes, it lies in our hands. I had to make a choice. No one was telling me to do this or do that. I had to make a choice. And I chose family. I chose it's good to have when they are there with me, I can always take care of other things. You know, things will happen. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess that's what helped. When I stepped down, I was sad. It took me six months to be me again because yeah. I was a little sad. I was a little upset. Am I making the right decision? I'm stepping down. I don't think I'll get that position again. So there were a lot of fears. Uh, I would say, I would never say I was frustrated, but fear factor was there. Yeah. What you are saying, which a lot of women will resonate. They will think if you step down, if you have that, it won't come again. It may or may not come again. So we have to be daring. If we decide about something, we have to be daring. But at the same time, don't be afraid to ask wherever you are going. Now the universities that I'm teaching, again, whenever there's something, I always ask them. 
that can I do this? Like today I'm supposed to speak, uh, today I have a very important masterclass just in two hours. Uh, so initially it was supposed to be at four in the evening. But then I asked my director, can I do it at one? Because I have something very important at four. In the evening, I'm, I'm going to be talking to the Union Minister of India. You know, it's like Teta Tet, where we are going to discuss about women development and children development, you know, so it's a very important thing. Mm -hmm. And the director was like, okay, I'll try to juggle you before time. So that's what I'm saying. Like if I would have said, no, I can't say no to my director, you know, maybe I was not speaking. And now I'm speaking at both places today. Right now I'm speaking with you in exactly. two hours in that masterclass and thereafter with the minister. So it's how you choose and how you ask, because if you don't open your mouth, if you don't tell to the other person, he or she will not know. No one knows what is happening inside us. Only we are aware of it. So it's never too late to ask. It's never too late to ask for help. If sometimes you need help, doesn't matter what important position you are having, but each one of us goes through that lean phase as well. So it's fine. It's show, show that you are weak at times as well. It's fine to show that you can also have a weak moment. You can also be fragile and ask for your help. You know, ask in your sisterhood networks, in your professional network. And I'm sure people will understand. People will empathize. Because if you always show I'm the superwoman, I'm the super mom, you know, then it looks kind of a bit fake because you can't be super all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we know you it. have your moments. <laughs> Every person has their moments and those, that's right. If it's perfect all the time, it's kind of like, well, we, we just know that there's a bit of smoke and mirrors happening there. Uh, exactly. <laughs> I love you tapped on a couple of key points there and one that we often have a scarcity mindset and I know that as I've been, you know, juggled my career around five children, uh, mm -hmm. you can sort of think, you know, oh, I can't miss this opportunity because it'll never happen again. You know, these blanket statements that are completely made up all in our own head. We just don't know. And I'm a big believer now, and I want to encourage those listening in that if, you know, if you are meant to be in doing what you're doing in that role, in that space, other opportunities will come again. And it might not be that exact position, but mm -hmm. when you're leaning into uh, what you're enjoying doing and what your skill set is, what your gifts are, that another opportunity will will come up come of um into into being and so uh it's a normal response to think i've got to take everything then you get the other <laughs> side of once you then established in your career that you get too many opportunities and so it's it's also that that comment that you said before of you know just ask and you'd be surprised at what could be juggled you know and mm -hmm. and and that's exactly true you know so many times you think i can't because they've booked me and that's just the way it is but you know, so often I have been, sh I've shown that when I've dared to sort of see if it's a bit flexible, it actually is, you know, if they're, you can't guarantee it once again, but True. more than often, it's kind of like, of course, if we can juggle it a, an hour or two and something, it, it doesn't inconvenience people, <laughs> you know, or if you're just worth it, you know, I think you'd be yeah. surprised. So the message there is be bold, you know, ask, you know, without being demanding and just see mm -hmm. what's possible. And uh, if, when you dare to, dare to see what's possible I think a lot of us would be very very surprised of, of what can come about so your very question true. now is women empowerment right that's your yes key yes passion. and so what does that mean to you you know what why do women still need to be uh, focusing on being empowered you know fighting for equality and their rights you know what makes you so passionate about this area I think women have always been empowered. It's not that we need to empower women. But when I, what I mean by empowerment is giving them the right frame of mind and right opportunities. That is important because women are strong. They are the ones who are the barrier, bearers of, uh, you know, they are bearing the child. They are giving birth to the child. So they are doing something what men can't do, you know. So they're already a little bit better <laughs> in handling those situations as well. Yeah. But... When we say empower women, it's like give them the responsibility. Don't tell that she's the weaker sex. You know, we are done away with those things. It's time now to give equal responsibility and equal pay for what they are doing. Because when you're giving them equal responsibility, and I'm sorry, you're not giving them the equal pay, that doesn't work. You mm -hmm. have to have an equal pay for women. Doesn't matter whether she's younger, older, what age she is. Because at some point of time, it is like, oh, you're younger. You have a couple of years but she is old or he is older, we need to give him the opportunity. I'm sorry, that doesn't work. 
he and you are at the same level both are working same both are giving similar things you know the output is pretty much the same then why are you differentiating there and that's my main concern whether we are women in a developed country or in a developing country women are not giving the right opportunity they are not they are devoid of giving the right opportunities in the first place and in some places even the right education if you have a son and a daughter still in some countries the son gets more privileges than mm. a daughter definitely if he is a son you know he is going to be the the, the bearer of our family he is going get, taking the dynasty further so we have to make sure that he is well educated he has a good job he has a good standing social standing and he is going further with it but as a girl she has to go to somebody else's house you know she is going to be married to somebody why spend that amount of time and energy on her so i think it's the mindset again we need to educate the people how they can bring about the change in the social mindset mm. not compare too much so when we are empowering women it's like one way starting from the very basics educate both girl and boy you know equally there should not be any discrimination there and second giving them equal opportunities at all stages whether it's their career whether it's their education choice whether it's a cho- choice for the marriage partner you know there's so many things where always women have to compromise mm. i don't say men don't compromise men also compromise but the amount of times amount of situations a woman is supposed to step down it's way more than what a man is doing or what oh. a man is asked to do exactly way more if you look at the statistics of women who have actually stopped working in certain roles because they're homeschooling children during a pandemic or yeah. have, you know sacrificed big time um it has been quite stark globally mm-hmm. actually mm-hmm. You know, it's the first ones to self sacrifice rather than looking mm-hmm. at opportunities to both co-share you know what flexibility there is in that males you know their mm-hmm. partners role and so forth so whether whether people think it's true or not it absolutely is true because the statistics are supporting uh, that in a massive massive trend what is a bigger issue then is it women believing in their worth and standing up and claiming that or is it re-educating men uh, and to accept that women mm-hmm. are of equal value i think it's a bit of both because yeah. women are always underestimating themselves and that's where i talk about women networks when we have these women networks like or i call them sisterhood networks yeah we give that gentle push to each other you are worth it go for it girl yes. you know don't underestimate yourself and that's where we need the boosting because most of the women when they are at a certain age oh i'm 40 plus i won't get that job mm-hmm. i'm 50 plus i'm not i'm not really the face that will work on television you know now i was in media i was once a big star not anymore do we with these kind of things you know it's there we need to give the push to the women especially that you are much more than what you see yourself in the mirror yes because mirror is not always telling you the truth you know it is just showing you what you want to see you know if you see i have wrinkles the wrinkles will start showing more or i look old you will look older than what you are thinking because we always magnify the things so that's why it's important to educate the guys educate the men folks that you have to respect women and you know give them the right opportunity so that's why it's a mix of both where we need to educate men the society at large and also further give the assurance to the women that you are much more so take a dive do not be afraid to go further and that's where we need to hold our friends hands doesn't matter which part of the world they are and move with them yes. and that's why women empowerment is necessary like when you empower them at whatever level they are they will feel happy they'll feel valued and they'll not be afraid they'll feel that i have the backing mm-hmm. i have some people who are with me so they will go further mm-hmm. i absolutely <laughs> love that and i love the essence of you know that's right collaborating supporting over competing you know women mm-hmm. have while the earlier uh, pioneering women often had to compete big time amongst um, others in their space and i think necessary at the time but it definitely doesn't work now you know now it's all about collaboration how can we uh, network globally which is even how we met uh, and i know we've both spoken on like women's economic forum and other sort of um, big events and and uh, and then we've also got our own tribes you know and i've got i've got a transformation academy there's so many academies and and different tribe um, groups out there there's some way some 
tribe for everybody. And so, and mm-hmm. many, most of them are very are free. You can just find them online, find people that you relate to. Why is it important? Because that's it. When you're not quite bold enough, quite quite brave enough, worrying about something, someone else exactly that your sister <laughs> will then go and say, "Hey, give it a go. What's the worst thing that can happen?" They could say no, or maybe no this time. And then um, people get braver and braver. And and I'm already seeing over the last few years incredible transformations happening in in different women in in my networks and around around the globe which is really encouraging so where to from here for you what's 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 next you know where do you go from um doing the work that you're doing uh what 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 are you excited about and moving into next right now i'm completely excited for my e-learning thingy <laughs> it's it's great it's like my baby which is uh, which i'm evolving as well together learning what i did that worked well in the first masterclass what didn't go so well in this one so i'm evolving because i have other modules as well that are coming up on women empowerment um, then uh, leadership courses then public speaking you know these are all in the pipeline they're all planned if you go on my website uh, which is www.rubybakshikurdi.com you will see all are there in the pipeline but the first two which i wanted was what i told you vle and emotion intelligence because that's the need of the hour uh, yeah. so i'm very passionate about it and i'm building on it i'm enjoying my uh, studio recordings it's something new as as a teacher i never thought i'll be doing it but i'm enjoying it you know standing in a particular way having the light in a particular way i'm learning those things you yeah. know to to i mean so it's it's something exciting because i'm seeing where i have to stand uh, the direction the place all those kind of things which i did when i gave my tedx talk you know i did a small portion of it like how much i should be on the red carpet where to move where not to move yeah. but now i'm doing it for my own business so it's very exciting i think for the moment that, that is my 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 sleep my drink my food everything <laughs> because it's very exciting <laughs> It's so exciting and it's unlimited because that's exactly it. When you're in the in this world of meeting with people, pretty much every challenge you get, you go, there's another course, there's another opportunity that I can share. And I love that because it comes back from where we started in this conversation. You know, your mm-hmm. roots and your community and your 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 faith and how important family is and communities. And so therefore all of that are passing on the knowledge, passing on mm-hmm. the wisdom, passing on that support is going to empower uh, people globally. And particularly young girls coming through who can sort of look to you and think, oh, my gosh, if, you know, if Ruby can do it, I can do it. And, uh, and then that can be, yeah, incredibly, it can change, it does actually change people's lives because belief is, is everything, right? If you don't believe Very true. the dream, Very true. Very uh, true. then you won't take those next steps. So, And I come from, in India, I come from Lucknow, you know, which is a, which is a big city as compared to, the the cities that we have in switzerland it's a big city but still it's like a it's not a very big town you know so i come from lucknow so whenever i'm sharing these kind of things the people in my city they're like oh you're doing so well you are you're really you're really making us feel that we can do it exactly what you just said anni you know it's not something that um, if you dream dreams do come true yes. it might take longer it might take little lesser or longer time whatever but you have to work on your dreams you can't just say i had a dream and gone exactly. if you have a dream work on your dreams you know mm-hmm. either you're working on it on a consistent basis either you have a to do list you need to do something so that you can do to evolve and implement those dreams they don't remain dreams for a long time so i think it's it's a mix of everything you know uh, your personality your work your consistency time management uh, especially as women we have to have uh we have to be wearing different hats at all the times uh just as we are very cautious about when we are wearing a red dress we carry a red bag <laughs> <laughs> so i think changing hats is also important not getting stuck with one place maybe you're successful success hits early in life great but maybe success is taking longer time so don't get disheartened and don't lose hope you know work consistently i think consistency is the mantra of the day because if we are consistent and we are passionate nothing can stop nothing can stop you 
I mean, all the things that are happening now, as I just said, were not planned. They're just happening and I'm going with the flow and I'm very happy with how it's going. <laughs> <laughs> but once again, if you just dreamed of having these courses and weren't consistent, didn't actually put yourself out, open yourself to learn new things about lighting and recording and, and speaking in a different way, then they wouldn't happen, you know, and that's exactly sure. it. You know, dream without action is a wish and that wish you can wish it your entire lifetime, right? So, very uh, so that's right, it's dedication is discipline but also that's not hard when you're actually doing it for all the right reasons doing it for mm -hmm. the, that you know it's important to you it will add value to yourself and those that you're serving and I think it's great that you are also continually learning and I, I've done that in my you know suddenly you're learning about creating websites or creating different videos and all the aspects of it and funnels and business and bits and pieces it's it shows that you know while you're we're all evolving and if you commit to leaning into that journey and finding out where it will come and, and then all the parts of it it's it is mm -hmm. it's stimulating and then the next minute you're thinking I should run a course on that and teach other people <laughs> how to do this uh the cycle goes on and um it's such a such a joy to be able to share that with everybody so let's finish our conversation then with this um podcast called memoirs of successful women and you're obviously a very successful woman what advice do you have to other people listening in about what you see success as you know what does it mean for you to be a successful woman Successful woman is something which comes if you believe in yourself, if you're authentic. Mm. There's no magic formula for getting the success. You need to create one. Mm. If you're passionate, if you're dedicated, and if you are ready to take any challenge that is coming up your way, feel the drive. Feel You have to be connected with it because if you're connected, you will have that passion that I need to do it. And automatically success will come. But if you're thinking, I have to be successful, I have to be, if you think about success before and you don't get it, then you are crashing down because your expectations are not meeting. So yes. don't have any expectations. That's what I tell everyone. Do not have any expectations. Just give it your best shot. Because if you have expectations and the expectations are not met, you feel disheartened, you feel frustrated. So the best is do it, <laughs> enjoy it. You know, and give it your 100%, you know, no compromise there, give it your 100%. And then you will see the results, the re results are going to flow longer, later, whatever. But don't think the success will happen with some magic wand, you have to have the magic, you need to create the magic and work on the magic every consistent day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I absolutely love that. That's right. The wand will work at times, but it's the icing on the cake. It's like, no, that's right. Believe it, do it, you know, love it, breathe it, get excited by it. And if you're not, then you're probably you're not in the right place, right? Every exactly. Exactly. Something when you exactly. eat it, everyone has something that just makes them get excited and lean into, and um, success will come your way. Thank you so much for being on my show today. It's been an absolute delight to meet you, and I just uh, I celebrate the work that you've done globally. Absolutely amazing, and I look forward to following you in all your future success. And I'll be putting your all of your contact details on my platform so that people can reach out to you and find out a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to learn from you and follow all your social media handles as well to learn and involve together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Memoirs of Successful Women. You can find me at anniegibbons.com where you can download my free resources, get connected on social and check out my online magic transformation program. If you love this show, feel free to subscribe to future episodes. And of course, share it with your friends. I'll see you again soon. And until then, happy podcasting.